So welcome to the 2022 Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit. <clears throat> I'd like to once again thank Keeneland for hosting us. Uh, they've been a great and incredible partner for this event. Uh, thanks to everyone here attending, those tuning in via the live stream, and all those that contributed to the past summits. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all the individuals this, this, in this industry that wake up 365 days a year to take care of this great animal, the thoroughbred racehorse. They get up and do the job and, that we dream about and the ideas that we think about in these rooms and put them into good practice. Uh, so as we got ready for the 10th Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit, we wanted to do a little research into the impetus for the original summit. And first, we'd like to thank Ed Bowen, uh, who's here today, and Dell Hancock, our chairman at Grayson, and the Grayson Board for really having the foresight uh, to come up with this in 2006. It seems like not long ago, but a long time ago now. So the impetus for the original summit was really a discussion amongst Grayson Board members examining the decline in starts per starter and asking the question, was this related to safety issues, a durability of the horse, un unsafe conditions, or was it other things? Well, after quickly realizing the starts per starter issue is a much larger uh, issue than a summit on horse safety and welfare could address, the participants quickly settled in on this. The welfare and safety of the racehorse should be the guiding principle in the decision-making process for all segments of the horse racing industry. So this led to two, recommend, or two summits that were closed door meetings of industry participants with limited uh, public uh, presentations, but the recommendations centered on a couple of areas. And those were, we had a lack of data for horses suffering fatality or injury. So in 2006, we couldn't tell you how many horses suffered a fatality on the racetrack. Uh, we had no surface lab to send materials to. We had no maintenance reporting for track services. We had no procedures, uh, equipment procedures in 2006. Now, when I say in 2006 in these years, of course we had one, two, three, or four tracks that were kind of doing these, but now these are more standard operating uh, procedures around the country. Uh, they recognized that we needed greater regulatory veterinarian oversight with establishment of necropsy programs, standardized pre-race exams, and the development of lab standards for an accreditation program. Uh, and we needed increased education for everyone involved. So I'd like to say since 2006, our industry has remained focused on safety and welfare of the horse. Now, some of these items may have been performed at one or two, like I said, but now I would like to say most are standard operating procedure across our industry and they've been undertaken to assist rider and equine safety. And I'd just like to read this list of things we've come up with, and I'm sure there's others. We created the equine injury database. So in 2006, we did not know how many horses suffered fatalities. And now Dr. Parkin's going to present risk factors on horses. So an amazing feat in a small amount of time. We have a racetrack surface laboratory that's dedicated to our industry for materials and is assisting other equine disciplines with their footing situations. We have equine treatment and procedure system for electronic reporting. We have standardized pre-race exams on all entered horses, the creation of the NTRA Safety and Integrity Alliance, the creation of the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium Lab Accreditation Program post-race exams on horses, necropsy programs and review committees for breakdowns, jockey health information system, protocol for putting all horses on the vets list, a protocol for working and testing horses off the vets list, regulatory veterinarian inspection of horses between starts, the elimination of traction devices on front shoes, ASTM certified vests and helmets on riders, void claim rules, padded crops, uniform national trainers exams for licensing and a study guide, specialized regulatory veterinarian continuing education, racetrack superintendent field day for education, concussion management for riders, weather protocol for riders and horse safety. That's just a short list we came up just to make remarks, but I'm sure there are others. And uh, we always know the goal is zero. But right now, we have seen substantial results in all these efforts in lowering the fatality rate. You'll hear a great program today about those efforts, about the equine injury database, about the surface testing lab, and other things that are going on across the country to keep our horses safe. But now, 
I'd like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies, Anise Mont Pleasure, the Equine Education Coordinator for the Kentucky Equine Education Project Foundation and President of Horse Amplify Horse Racing, and she'll be our Master's of Ceremony for the day, and thank you for attending. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit. My name is Anise Mont Pleasure, and I am so excited to be joining all of you for this very important event to our industry. I first became interested in the thoroughbred industry after learning the story of the legendary Philly Ruffian. And so fittingly, Ruffian would actually become the subject of my first ever public speaking engagement, which was presenting a competitive speech at my state 4-H horse show when I was 14. And it was thanks to that speech, and we'll say thanks to Ruffian, that I was actually able to visit Kentucky for the first time to present it at a national competition. And as I was researching for that speech and my interest and passion for the thoroughbred industry started to develop and grow, so did my curiosity to better understand what was happening in the space of welfare and safety and supporting the health and longevity of our amazing equine athletes. And I'm sure that many of you probably have a story that is similar to mine and that it was a particular horse who inspired not only your pursuit of being involved in the industry, but your pursuit of developing your knowledge of the industry and becoming a great steward of the horses that are at the center of all of this. And that's what brings all of us here today for this event. So it is a great confidence that I can say that 14-year-old uh, Denise would be very excited for me and the fact that I get to stand before all of you today and not only introduce the incredible experts that we're going to get to learn from, but also I'm here to learn as well alongside all of you. So with that, we are going to transition into uh, our first presentation, which is a fitting one to kick us off, as this has been a topic at the forefront of the summit since its impetus, and that is the Equine Injury Database, which was first proposed at the Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit in October of 2006. What followed was a 13-month pilot program during which over 3,000 injury reports were received and recorded, leading to the official launch of the Equine Injury Database in July of 2008. Now everything is recorded digitally in an extensive database that seeks to identify the frequency, types, and outcomes of racing injuries using a standardized format that will generate valid statistics, identify markers for horses at increased risk of injury, and serve as a data source for research directed at improving safety and pre preventing injuries. Joining us to provide an update on the equine injury database is Dr. Tim Parkin, head of Bristol Veterinary School at the University of Bristol. Welcome, Dr. Parkin. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here once again, um, and particularly a pleasure to be back here in person after the travails of the last couple of years. It um, makes a massive difference to come and do these things in person rather than have to sit behind a screen and do those awful Zoom and Teams meetings um, with multiple people on board. Um, I'm going to give you a brief update on what we've been doing over the last um, few years with respect to the Equine Energy Database. Um, a few things to uh, talk about. Firstly, just a uh, bring you up to speed as to where we are with respect to the annual audit figures that we do on an annual basis for the Jockey Club. Talk a little bit about what happened last year with our two-year-olds. Um, and then a question that came from uh, the Thoroughbred Safety Committee for the Jockey Club asking about the difference in uh, risk associated with horses that um, stick to one surface or those that compared to those that change surface as they go through their career. And then finally, just a little bit of a uh, section on uh, sudden death and what we've been doing in, in that field as well. So uh, looking at the annual fatality uh, figures and reminder that these fatal injury reports are reports of any horse that died or was euthanized within 72 hours of a race date. Um, overall uh, figures on all surfaces, as you, I'm sure you're aware, 
Uh, the figures have come down quite substantially uh, since 2009, representing a 31% reduction in the risk of fatal injury um, from a high in 2009 of around 2 to, for the first time this year, I believe, uh, dipping below 1.5 per thousand starts on those uh, participating uh, racetracks. Obviously, dirt being the predominant service in this part of the world, then that very closely mirrors what we see in the overall figures. But again, a very substantial reduction in risk, 36% reduction in risk uh, since 2009 to uh, 2021, hovering just above the 1.5 per thousand starts. Again, a substantial reduction since the, uh, from the 2.1 per thousand starts that we saw in 2009. Um, looking at turf, uh, obviously with fewer starts and the line is a little bit more up and down, a little bit more wavy, but again, a substantial reduction, about a 30%, 28% reduction uh, from uh, 2009 to 2020. And then finally, synthetic, um, <clears throat> a very substantial, more than 50% reduction in risk compared to that first year. Now that first year was a particularly uh, high point, obviously about 1.5. So uh, that, that, lean, that uh, contributes very significantly to that very significant reduction. But it's, a, it's, it's very pleasing to see, after a small uptick last year, a return to uh, the uh, general trend in a downward direction for synthetics, now down at about 0 0.75 per thousand starts in terms of fatal injuries um, on those particular surfaces. So last year was a bit of a 2021 data was a bit of a, a strange year uh, in terms of what we saw, um, particularly for the risk associated with two-year-olds. Um, and it, I don't think there's a year goes by when I come over and, and speak here where someone doesn't ask me about the risk associated with two-year-old horses and whether we should be racing two-year-olds. So it did um, throw us a little bit uh, when we saw the figures that suggested that actually there'd been a spike in two-year-old fatal injuries uh, last year. These data um, represent, the red line here is the, year, the annual figures for four-year-olds, okay? So uh, this is what we've seen in four-year-old pluses, horses. Uh, this is what we've seen in three-year-olds as we go from 2009 through to 2021. You'll see that in the three-year-old group, I've, I've pointed out years, year on years, where there'd been a significant increase from the previous year. And this was a, in, I think it was 2013 to 2014 in the three-year-olds, there was a 21% increase in the risk from the previous year in terms of the risk of fatal injuries per thousand starts on the track. Now, those are the four-year-old plus and the three-year-old uh, lines. So the four-year-old plus are the uh, red line and the blue line is the three-year-olds. And then if we overlay the two-year-old figure, again, I pointed out year-on-year uh, -year changes where we've seen a, what you might regard as significant change. And certainly in 2011 and 2012, we saw a, a reasonably significant increase on the previous year, 16 and then 17 percent increase. But what we saw last year from 2019 to 2020 was a 43 percent increase in the risk of fatal injury in our two year olds. And that really did throw us. That was not something we were expecting at all. And if you look at the lines, for the most part, then uh, three and four year old pluses, they intertwine with each other. They kind of trade places in terms of whether the three-year-olds are at slightly increased risk or the four-plus-year-olds are at slightly increased risk. But in no other year has the two-year-old risk been above either of those two particular lines. And 2020, the value for two-year-olds was higher than both the value for three-year-olds and the value for four-plus-year-olds. So it really was a surprising, surprising finding. Um, it is obviously, as you see, uh, gratifying to see that actually in the most recent data, then the two-year-old's um, risk of fatality has returned to what you might regard as normal trend, and it's come back down, well, for the first time to be below one per thousand starts. So we're glad to see that it's back on track, but it did raise some questions about what happened last year. And uh, uh, from <clears throat> discussing with the Thoroughbred Safety Committee, we then took, um, data from workouts recorded in the EID. And th this plot is a little bit um, difficult to see, but what you're seeing here is each year from 2009 to 2021, and on the y-axis here, we've got the number of EID recorded workouts per horse per month. And you've got month of March through to December here. And you can see that for the most part, from 2009 to 2019, 
all the years are clustered in amongst each other. There is some fluctuation, but there's, there's no one year that really stands out, apart from 2020. And these are the lines in the early part of the year, March through to June for 2020, when the number of workouts was clearly uh, impacted, uh, workouts per horse, was, per horse was clearly impacted by what was going on in that spring of 2020 with COVID, et cetera. Now, the number, the, the actual numerical difference might be quite small, but actually I think it doesn't take necessarily an enormous difference in the number of workouts or the amount of training that a two-year-old doing is potentially to, to, to have a potential impact on the risk of fatal injury and how the bones adapt in those particular horses. And it is interesting to see that we did see a similar, probably less pronounced training disruption in the older age horses, but we didn't see that impact on their risk of fatal injuries. Um, what we did see uh, later on in the year, we think, with this, this line going up through here, we did see some attempt at compensation for a lack of exercise early in the year in those two-year-olds as well, which may also have contributed somewhat to the increased incre uh, uptick in risk of fatal injuries for those two-year-olds in 2020. Now, obviously, these are purely data and actually trying to take that from uh, correlation through to causality is somewhat difficult, but I know Larry will talk a little bit after me about how this might relate to uh, adaptation in the bone and then therefore how it might have actually resulted in an increased risk in those two-year-olds. Uh, interestingly, if we then add on 2021 here, and that's a black line you can't really see amongst all the other lines, but that tells us that essentially the 2021 workouts per horse per month were back to normal. And actually that then ties very nicely in with the fact that actually we've seen a significant reduction in the risk in those two-year-olds uh, 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 in 20, 2021, as I said, with the risk per thousand starts dipping below one for the first time. So that gives us some anecdotal uh, evidence to suggest that yes, there is quite a strong relationship between uh, the number of workouts horses are doing and the interruption in training and therefore the, uh, the risk that those particular horses were at um, uh, in 2020, purely due, due to the disruption in training due to COVID. I was asked um, at the Thoroughbred Safety Committee, then asked about, well, you're not going to see an immediate impact of that reduction in work on the risk of fatal injury. Uh, and you'd expect a lag in the uptick in fatal injury, which I think is what we have seen. Now, there is a bit of a caveat uh, with respect to these data in that we are talking about the number of fatal injuries on tracks by two-year-olds per month and in no one month is that greater than 10 individual horses so we are bound to see quite a lot of fluctuation when we put that against the denominator looking for a, a per thousand risk but nevertheless it is quite interesting to see that actually if you look at the red line here that goes through that's the average number of fatal injuries per thousand starts in two-year-olds in 2015 to 19 and then the green line is what we saw in 2020 uh, with two clear, uh, sorry, three clear peaks in June, September, and then December that we hadn't seen at all in the previous years. Interestingly, in uh, 2021, we did also see a peak in June that actually exceeded the peak in 2020 uh, uh, June, but then actually it fell back for the rest of the year, it fell back much closer to the norm and what we more normally expect. So is this evidence that there's a definitive link between uh, the disruption in training and then the lag and then an increase in risk of fatal injury? Well, I think it's, it's somewhat evidential, but as I said, it's quite difficult to be sure given that uh, we are talking about relatively small, small number of individual horses on any particular month uh, <coughs> of the year uh, when we're just talking about two-year-olds. Um, a question that was posed to us um, uh, from the Thoroughbred Safety Committee was about horses that tend to stick to the same surface and those that tend to then move on to different surfaces and whether the level of risk for those individual horses is somewhat different to those that happen to be switching between different surfaces. Now, this question might on the face of it seem like a relatively simple question to try and start answering, but actually when we looked at the data and actually saw the, different, the numerous different permutations of um, changes of surface that lots and lots of horses undertake, actually creating a profile that is typical, in quotes, of 
uh, your average horse that sticks to dirt or your average horse that then goes from dirt to turf or turf to dirt is somewhat difficult. And actually you end up with multiple, multiple um, different uh, levels of risk for all the different potential permutations of horse as they switch between surface. Nevertheless, we have produced something that looks um, something like this. Um, first of all, the uh, line, dotted lines here are the risk on dirt, turf, and synthetic for all horses, regardless of their prior history, whether they've been on whichever surface that happens to be. So that's just the baseline level. Uh, if you took all the data from 20, 2009 through to 2021, that's the baseline level on dirt, turf, and synthetic. <coughs> The dots here, so we've got, oh, sorry, we've got a red dot here that indicates the risk for horses that are, have only ever, up to that point in their career, have only ever raced on dirt. We've got a blue dot here, which is the risk for horses that are up to that point in their career have only ever raced on synthetic. And we've got a green dot here that is, represents the risk for horses up to that point in their career where they've only ever raced on turf. What we're interested in is then to see, okay, you take a horse that's only ever been racing on dirt and actually its first change is then onto a different surface, either that be turf or synthetic, then what is the risk going forward for that individual horse? So you take a horse that's gone from dirt and it goes, its first changes to synthetic, then its risk drops reasonably considerably, but certainly gets nowhere near the level of risk, overall level of risk on synthetic. You take that same dirt horse and it goes to turf, it gets closer to the overall level of risk on turf but still lies above the overall level of risk on turf. If you take a horse that's only previously been racing on synthetic and its first change is to dirt, it's certainly its risk for the rest of its career then is actually very much more closely related to the overall risk on dirt. And you take that horse and you change it to turf for its first switch, it very closely mirrors the overall level of risk on turf. And then finally, if you take a horse that's gone from turf, its first change is to synthetic. Actually, it looks like its risk actually increases. It doesn't go towards the overall synthetic risk. It actually increases somewhat to above what might experience if it stayed on turf. And if you take it from turf to dirt, make its first, first switch to dirt, then again, that comes much closer to what you might already uh, automatically expect on dirt for all horses that are experiencing a dirt surface. So how do we interpret these? Well, I think uh, for all those horses racing on dirt, uh, regardless of their history, whether they have, have been continually racing on dirt or whether they made a switch, then they are all somewhat close to, but below, the overall level of risk on dirt. For those horses racing on turf, they are above and below the overall level of risk of racing on turf, so somewhat turf, somewhat in the region. But those horses that started on synthetic or were only ever raced on synthetic are quite significantly different in their level of risk uh, compared to those horses that start on synthetic and then switch to either turf or dirt. Now, those estimates, sorry, those estimates might be somewhat, um, how do I go back? Those estimates might be somewhat uh, difficult to pinpoint because there are relatively few horses that switch from synthetic to turf or dirt, so there will be quite like, wide confidence intervals around those. Um, I think what's important, actually, if we look at the horses that do move, so if they've come from um, uh, a different surface, synthetic or turf, onto dirt, those horses are at similar but slightly lower reduced risk compared to those horses that are consistently on dirt. So you could almost anticipate that they retain some of the safety aspects of being a turf or a synthetic horse. Those horses that move on to turf are at similar but slightly higher risk compared to those who are consistently on turf, regardless of whether they come from synthetic or dirt. And those, those horses that move on to synthetic, whether they've come from dirt or turf, they don't get anywhere near the level of risk that you would see for a horse that is consistently on uh, synthetic or indeed the level of risk for a horse that is overall level of risk on synthetic. 
Now, as I said, those two dots there are relatively smallly populated by relatively few numbers, so it would be quite difficult to draw any significant conclusions about that. And certainly, we recognize that what we've done here is just take the first switch for a particular horse as being the switch that represents its future risk, and actually being able to further profile horses that then switch from turf to dirt and then back to turf, for example, is something we want to take forward and actually understand which of those individual horses with different surface profiles present perhaps the greatest risk is something we want to take forward. So this is just our first look at these. Um, I think it's interesting enough to present here and certainly shows that there are certainly significant impacts of the surface that horses are racing on, which we all know about, but actually some horses will retain some of their predominant um, or previous level of risk that might have been built up because they've been racing on different surfaces or they're a particular type of horse that is prone or uh, 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 particularly useful on a synthetic or a turf, turf type track that then happens to switch uh, for other reasons. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about just briefly is just sudden death. <clears throat> um, and first of all, just to present some figures. So this is a the plot on the left is slightly different to the overall fatal injury rate that you've seen before. This is just pulling out MSI, so musculoskeletal injury, fatal injuries, uh, and the risk per thousand starts since 2009 all the way through to 2020. And you can see, as you can imagine, it mirrors very closely what we see in overall fatal injury because these contribute about 90% of all fatal injuries anyway. What we see uh, uh, with respect to sudden death is a relatively flat line. Now, just to note here, I've kept these on the same scale just so that we can see that actually obviously sudden death is uh, significantly uh, less predominant, uh, prevalent than uh, musculoskeletal injury is an important thing to, to remember. If we, um, if we change the scale slightly, then we see um, uh, quite a bit of variation going on with respect to sudden death. Um, Although I put here there's been an 18% drop since uh, 2009 to 2021, if we'd actually done this last year, then actually we'd have seen an increase in the risk of sudden death. So I, for me, this is a bit of a flat line, not really going up or down in any particular great detail, um, certainly not in the same level of evidence to suggest as we've got here that musculoskeletal injuries are going down by about 31%, have gone down by about 31% since uh, 2009. So we can see that actually for us, this is, kind of useful because it suggests that the risk factors we've identified and actually people are starting to take note of and developing interventions for regulatory change etc have had an impact in the area we might expect them to have actually on musculoskeletal injuries but those same risk factors haven't had the same impact on sudden death so obviously the thing to do is to then develop a multivariable model that actually identifies what those risk factors might be for sudden death in particular and actually see whether the particular risk factors we can take that we can then impact on and then actually try and uh, reduce the risk of sudden death as well as uh, the risk of musculoskeletal injury. Um, probably the reason that people are talking more about sudden death, obviously uh, apart from potential high profile cases, is that actually because of the reduction in the overall contribution of musculoskeletal injuries to the total number of fatal injuries and actually the proportion of horses that are, overall horses that are dying uh, due to sudden death is obviously, obviously rising. Uh, and whereas previously in 2009 it would have been about five, between 5 and 6%, it's now, for a couple of the most recent years, has tipped over 10%. The proportion of all fatal fatalities on the track that are related to a sudden death has now ticked up above 10%. And that's purely driven by the reduction, obviously, in the total number of horses that are dying due to musculoskeletal injuries. I'm not saying that the risk of sudden death is going up at all, but it's certainly staying level. So that's probably why people are talking more about sudden death than they previously have done because they're noticing it more uh, uh, on the track. So we have produced a, a risk factor model for uh, sudden death. I don't have time to present it now. We're, we're looking to uh, uh, publish it in, in JAVMA in, the, in uh, the next few months or at least uh, submit it to the journal. Just something to say about this. It's important to note that sudden death is, is coded in the EID records. 85% of them are coded as SUD, so sudden death. 15% of our cases were pulmonary hemorrhage, EIPH, post-exertional distress, cardiac arrhythmia, or multiple codes from the same list. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the case definitions are rather broad. We don't really necessarily have very good understanding of what causes sudden death in many of these horses, that many of them aren't post-mortem, and even if they were, then you're not guaranteed to be able to identify and pin down the cause of death anyway. 
But we have identified a range of risk factors. And as I said, I'm not going to go through them all, but I did want to highlight one just for this particular audience. Um, uh, and we identified for the first time a relationship between the use of Lasix in the race and sudden death, uh, and indeed any, any outcome we're talking about. And actually, the use of Lasix in the race uh, increases the risk of sudden death by about 62%. Now, anyone who knows anything about statistics will see that this p-value is relatively close to being statistically significant or not. Um, and that is very, very much driven by the fact that actually very few horses, very few of our starts uh, as a proportion were uh, horses that were not on Lasix. And these data go away all back to 2009, so I recognize there's been regulatory change that is slowly reducing, to a certain extent, the number of horses that start on Lasix uh, in more recent years. <clears throat> but even disregarding um, that particular uh, p-value here, actually, if you look at the overall risk uh, of sudden death um, per thousand starts when you're not on Lasix being about 0 0.08 compared to when you are on Lasix being about 1.13 per thousand starts, I think there is evidence there that there is a, some sort of physiological uh, uh, relationship potentially between the use of Lasix and sudden death that certainly warrants further investigation. I think the reason that this won't have been identified before is purely due to statistical power. And we, it, essentially, when you've got more than 95%, 90% of uh, starts being made on Lasix, and it's very difficult to identify uh, a difference between those that are and uh, not on Lasix, uh, simply because we have very few that aren't. So actually, this, this is purely driven by the fact we now have sufficient number of years of data and sufficient uh, sudden deaths in the database to enable us to draw this conclusion. But I think it's certainly something that's worthy of uh, uh, further thought and further discussion. I'd be interested to know um, and, and understand more about exactly the uh, impact of uh, Lasix on, on exercising horses and actually how that changes their blood, blood, blood biochemistry and perhaps contributes to the risk of cardiac arrhythmias, for example. So with that, thank you for listening. I'd just like to acknowledge the help of Matt, Kristen, and Jamie. As always, um, uh, enormous help that I gave, gave from those two, an enormous industry insight that helps us direct where we should go with all of these analyses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Parkin. We'll now welcome Dr. Larry Bramlage to the stage, surgeon and partner at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital, to present on building a two-year-old skeleton for racing. This is a continuation from two previous presentations by Dr. Bramlage at the Welfare and Safety of the Race Horse Summit. The first in 2012 on selected effects of training and racing on the musculoskeletal system, and the most recent one from 2014 on training and bone development in racing.